Okay, so welcome to today's uh, Next Level uh, Mastermind session. Uh, we do these Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 12 East, uh, post the recordings in the Next Level Mastermind. Um, today we're gonna do, we're gonna have a guest. Uh, and the guest is my friend, Andrew Robinson from Columbus, Ohio. Andrew, you and I met, you were not in real estate yet, but you came to a real estate marketing conference. You're, you're, a, you're a madman. Yeah, I uh, lived in Columbus and you and uh, Josh were in Lancaster, PA, I believe, and uh, drove out there to spend, uh, I think, two, two days with you in one of your mastermind meetings. And I think that goes back seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And at the time you were selling furniture, but I think you were thinking about jumping into real estate at the time. Yeah. I was. I, I owned an advertising agency and I felt like in real estate, one of the things that, that uh, I was seeing is agents really didn't invest at that time um, in the type of uh, advertising that I thought would be beneficial for their clients. And that's right. kind of what drew me to it. Cool. And then you started, I, I'm getting a little fuzzy. Was it like 16 or 17 when you, you finally jumped in? Um, I actually got my license in 2014 in um, that year. And uh, the first listing that I went after, I'm sure people will appreciate this, was $1.1 million. So go big or go home, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and that's part of the reason I wanted to have you on because you you quickly jumped right in and you went straight after the luxury market. Uh, you didn't mess around um, and you got your production up. Do you want to share, you know, not to brag, but do you want to just share sure. kind of where your numbers went the first year and, and where they've landed you know, now. Um, well, the first year, obviously, you know, sometimes when you list a luxury property, it takes a little bit longer to sell. Um, so I think my first year of production was in the probably the four million dollar range, but then it uh, went to 14 million, um, 17 million. And I've consistently been right between the 20 and 21 million dollar range for the last three years. Awesome. And you're solo, right? You bet you barely have an assistant or you have maybe one part. Correct. I Correct. I don't actually um, have a legitimate assistant. I do have a referral partner who I will refer some buyer um, agents to, but I, I really need to solidify that because um, it, it just doesn't make sense for me to spend a bunch of time with buyers down below, let's say 300,000 in my market. Awesome. Um, so we did a session on LinkedIn last week and I kind of tried to grab you last minute, but I think as a follow-up to that, all I did on that session was just run a simple uh, pay-per-click ad um, sure. But I think, you know, the reason I, was, I asked you to come on uh, was one to talk about the luxury stuff you're doing, but maybe we can start with LinkedIn and just uh, get a little tactical. I'm looking at your profile here. Do you have, uh, I know you're pulling listings out of LinkedIn. You want to talk about how you're doing that? <laughs> sure. Um, you, you, LinkedIn is just like any other social media platform. You have to understand who your avatar is and who you're going after. And with a lot of my uh, clients being doctors, uh, and people in the, the medical field, I was very, very purposeful in going into LinkedIn every single day when I first got started and following and looking at people like, like searching Columbus, Ohio doctor, Columbus, Ohio physician, and um, putting content out there that was somewhat relevant. And um, the great thing is, is once you start getting a little bit of traction, if they like your post, um, then it starts to be distributed to a, to a greater environment. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the success story real quick. Um, I also would go after investment counselors and try to become friends with them on there because they have a, a high net worth client database. So I would consistently try to post at least three or four times a week on LinkedIn. And, and the messaging there is maybe a little bit different than when we put something out on social media. I try to put some information about why I'm doing something. So for instance, my post today was a post about why I'm using uh, 3D videos, because one, they get higher levels of engagement from the client, uh, more time on site. And it's basically challenging uh, that that prospective client to say, is your agent doing these type of things? Gotcha. So you're showing, you're, you're talking about the things you're doing, the strategies that you're employing to kind of. Uh... Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm obviously trying to present one of my properties, but I'm also putting out that little teaser saying, what, this is why I'm using 3D video. This is why I'm using aerial video. This is why I'm using um, all of this, the techniques that I do because now I'm creating doubt in their mind if their agent is doing that. So I want them, the prospective seller or buyer to, to look at me as being an expert because I'm, I'm investing in these things. 
All right, so, so positions you as an expert. Um, in this case, you know, uh, so they get the idea right. to work with, with you. Now, it doesn't always have to be luxury listings. Anybody who's in any niche could kind of translate Absolutely. into what they're doing, you know. Absolutely. I, I think that it's really important now to really go multimedia with all of our listings. Obviously, we learned during the pandemic that I, I actually sold a $1.7 million house. We're in contract right now. And the homeowner, the woman, um, has never been in the house. She saw it from a video. She did a 3D tour. Her husband is a relocation um, person. So he went through the property, but the wife actually bought into the whole process by only seeing the house via 3D tour. Gotcha. So you're, how are you doing your tours? Are you using Matterport or a third party? Um, I, I like that what you just went over to is a Zillow tour. Zillow is a, is a free app. And I think that it really increases the engagement for people that are on Zillow and increases their time on site. For instance, I know that uh, I think 3,400 people have actually taken this tour and this house just came on the market yesterday. Well, and I'm getting 44 uh, seconds of time on site, which I, I, everybody wants to make sure that people are looking at their property versus the competing property. So now I, go ahead. So, so you, I'm not familiar with this. I probably should be, but Zillow has a native app that allows you to do a 3D tour. Do you, 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 cool. took, you took the tour? Um, yeah, I, I have a Theta, I have a Theta V camera, which is this big. Um, and it, I, I actually do the tour myself, which some people say, well, why do you do that? Well, mentally, what that does help me do is write my description for the property while I'm in the property. So sometimes when we leave the property, you don't remember it very well. But by having spent an extra 30 minutes in the property doing the 3D tour myself, um, that helps. And by the way, this technology is really cheap. The Theta V camera is about a $400 camera. And the Zillow software is 100% free. If you want to incorporate the Theta V into Matterport, um, then you can do, I think, a $9 a month subscription for Matterport and have up to five active tours at any time. That's awesome. Um, but the advantage, it sounds like, to loading your tour into Zillow is that Z Zillow organically will kind of feature it because it has a tour and a lot of people will find it. Correct. But if you want to feed a tour to realtor.com, they're obviously not going to take the Zillow feed. So sometimes I will duplicate, depending on the value of the property, I will duplicate that with a Matterport tour as well. Great. What percentage of the competition is doing this too? Okay. Well, obviously in the, in the premium luxury price, I'm seeing most people doing it. But when you get down, in my market, the average retail is 268,000. We're seeing that climb a little bit. Um, I personally do these tours on virtually every property I do because I feel like I'm branding me with every every single um, advertisement that I put out there. I'm trying to sell the property, but I'm also trying to brand myself. Right, right. And so. uh, just to interject, Andrew, what was the name of that camera that you're using again, people are asking? It's a, it's a Ricoh Theta V. Um, Rico also has a Z1, which is like a thousand dollar camera. I don't think you need that technology. Um, the other thing that's required for doing a Zillow tour, I'll just put that out there, is you need an Apple product. So you need an Apple iPhone or you need an Apple MacBook um, or like a tablet. It's not compatible with, um, with uh, the, the Google okay. phone. Okay. And then if you're not going to do your own, there are plenty of people in most markets who are doing this, right? It's kind of... Uh, uh, absolutely. My, my photographer, um, when I get a package from them, they will include uh, photographs, video, aerial, aerial flyover, aerial photographs, aerial video. And then this is an add-on that they'll add. Um, in my market, I think it's about $100 to add the tour. And I highly recommend that investment. Great. Now your your LinkedIn is full of just, I mean you're just a pro. And I, I I I thought it was really cool to watch how because you used to you used to be in a really competitive space. You furniture right? You marketed Correct. furniture. Um, Correct. And yeah. it seems like you've translated a lot of that kind of stuff into into the luxury home market. You know a lot of the techniques uh, specifically where you're you're kind of like the spokesperson for your real estate business. Um, and a lot of these run like commercials to me. 
<laughs> they did. They they're also storytelling. I mean, that particular video, which don't play it now, but people that follow my link, um, it tells a story which we hear all the time in the real estate industry. A, a, a seller called me and they're like, "Hey, Andrew, I'm thinking about selling my house in March." can you swing by and give me an evaluation? And that was in October. And I'm, I'm like, hey, wh why are you thinking about waiting until March? And the story's in the video. But um, when I met with him, I'm like, look, if you were in a traditional subdivision where the houses were between 300 and 500,000, those people moved during the selling, the, the school selling season. But this particular house, I think was a $1.3 million house. And those executives are not locked into that selling season. So I'm like, mm, I think we should try to put the house on the market now. And I think we put the house on the market at a million two fifty, maybe the first week of November. We had multiple offers. We went $40,000 over the ask price. And this is back in 2017. So it was just a story of you don't always have to wait until the to the proper time to get the house on the market. So you, you documented, uh, you told the story, you documented what you did with another client. You kind of create this feedback loop by putting it on YouTube. You put it on LinkedIn and right. then the doctors, the lawyers, the financial planners, whoever you've kind of networked with on, on LinkedIn then sees this. Um, Correct. So I, I'm really creating a story that I can share. And w when I when I have a listing appointment, for instance, I've created a Google um, template and within the template, uh, and I, I frankly don't want to share that because it's somewhat proprietary, but yeah. within the template, um, I include said, hey, Ryan, thank you so much. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow afternoon. When I spend time with you, I want to learn more about you. So I want to take this opportunity to share some of my philosophy. So I tell stories about previous marketing. I put links to all of my online reviews. I put links to videos, to 3D tours. So by the time I've shown up, they've been immersed in a multimedia, which is all about me. So it's like, but it's usually my clients talking about me. So yeah. it, it helps me when I sit down, they already feel like I'm the expert. Um, Persuasion, which is one of Robert uh, Cialdini's books. I'm familiar with that one. Persuasion um, uh, is a good one, guys. I mean, kind of what you're doing is that people are pre persuaded to uh, <laughs> to work with you. Your, your listing appointments must go pretty easily, right? You're not convincing them of much. Um, the, they go pretty easily. Um, obviously, many of my properties are non-conforming properties so we, we get into that valuation you know where what could the house be worth because it's, it's such a unique property um i do struggle and i think we all do um you get that appointment and the and the client says well will you list my house for four yeah. <laughs> percent obviously we we're seeing more and more of that um and, and i obviously have a response to that but um we all we all have to be prepared because i feel like there's compression in in the in the um the commission structure that we can all get out there and, and i'm sure your response at this point uh, probably has something to do with the extra value they're going to get out of you versus the four percent guy um and they've already, yeah they've already Absolutely. had a taste they've already had a taste of that right. they've seen what you do um, right yeah. right so what you but in the beginning you didn't have that did you so you had to kind of did you have to fake it till you made it, <laughs> it, it, it you know i <laughs> The, my first listing that I ended up getting was on the uh, the 18th green of the Mirfield uh, tournament course, the PGA tournament course. So it was extremely prestigious. And I leveraged that for many, many months before I listed it. Um, the way I got that was a complete, uh, how should I say, I, I masqueraded as doing a report on the entire neighborhood and I called up the pre the homeowner which was an expired listing and I I said hey I, I'm doing a report on the neighborhood and I'd just like to get your feedback on what what transpired when you were on the market so I got in in front of the CEO of a, of a large company and um, leveraged that to to my business where it is now right so Actually, let, let, let me say that Ryan one of the things that I always say is level up. So if someone's currently doing a lot of production at 300,000, they shouldn't immediately try to do a million dollar property, but they should try to push their envelope, their comfort envelope from 300 to 500, because you, you always are, if you're able to leverage that up, I'll give you an example. When I had the $750,000 listing, um, an NHL hockey player came in and he says, Hey, I like this property, but I want something with a better view of the golf course and maybe a bigger house. So 
what I did is I, I did what I call the, the yellow letter strategy. And I'm sure people know what that is, where I drove around the golf course. I found a house that was gorgeous, um, that, that had a wonderful view. And it was probably in the $1.3 million range. And I wrote the owner a letter and the letter said, Hey, I'm working with an NHL hockey player. He wants to be a, to have a house on the course with a view like yours, with a prestigious address like yours. It was really a flowery letter. And I went and I dropped it off in a FedEx package. So I was, I was so, I was so cheap at the time. I didn't even pay to mail it. I put it in the FedEx package, drove to their house and put it on the front door. And the guy called me the next day. And that ended up being my first million dollar listing um, from lever leveraging up from the 750 listing. Did you um did you sell it to the hockey player or did you just use him as as no the... no um keep in mind the, the hockey player was someone that I met at an open house. He was not my client, but I used that connection to say, hey, I, I'm working with yeah. working with um, a hockey player that's looking for something on the course. So, you know, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't call it deceptive because if, yeah. if it would have been the perfect house for the hockey player, he would have gone to look at it. It, it ended up not being the perfect house for him, but. Um, yeah. It's the same as if you have a few investor clients and you send a, you send a mailer and you say, Hey, I'm working with some investors. They're not specifically looking in the neighborhood, but they're open to deals anywhere in the region. Um, it's, exactly. You're, you're exactly. kind of, and what you're doing there. I see a lot of people don't do this. You you're creating business out of thin air where it wasn't before. Um, you, you're doing the actual act of brokerage. You're matching sellers to buyers, and you went and you found a seller to match to a buyer. Yeah. One of the things I've just done recently, Ryan, is because just like every other market, um, in in our market, there's very very little inventory under five hundred thousand, um, and I have a buyer client, and their name is. Kevin and Emily. So what I did is I created a video, which I'm running on as a Facebook ad. And the video it uses a crayon drawing of it's probably it may not be on LinkedIn, it's probably on my uh, Facebook page. But mm -hmm. it shows a picture, a crayon drawing of Kevin and Emily, because for privacy reasons, I didn't want to put pictures of them for real. And um, following your pattern interruption that you always that you always do with your advertising. Um, I'm getting a lot of uh, a lot of click through and a lot of engagement with that. And then it sends them to, I, I use KV Core and I have some other landing pages as well. So I think I've sent some of the traffic to KV Core and some to a different uh, landing page. Is it is it Awesome Ohio Homes or something? Your uh, it's uh, um, Awesome, no, it's uh, Pal Ohio Homes, I think. Amazing, amazing, amazing Pal Ohio homes. Oh, just, just in case people want to check it out. You're, sure. uh, but you're, you're, so you're posting content across multiple channels. Um, right. Uh, sometimes you're using paid. A lot of times you're benefiting from a organic. You told me last week you had somebody reach off off an organic post, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Um, so the great thing about LinkedIn, I have about 8,000 followers on um, LinkedIn. And I'm looking at you're doing the video there. Um, so because I try to post something every single day to engage people during the Super Bowl, an attorney that's I'm connected to on LinkedIn, I haven't personally talked to him since 2003, but he, he saw one of my posts about a $1.7 million listing and I get a text during the Super Bowl. Hey, Andrew, not sure you if you remember me, but um, um, my wife and I are thinking about selling our house. If you're interested, give me a call. And he put his phone number in there. So I obviously texted him back immediately. I said, hey, Chuck, I'd love to chat with you. Let's get together tomorrow. So now that has turned into um, a pocket listing at about 900 to a million dollars. And the funny thing, Ryan, is if you go up my page a little bit, um, you'll see a picture of a car barn. Oh, yeah, and, he showed me this one, yeah. So, so what I'm doing is I'm I'm we have the the fair cooperation rules just like everybody else does so i really can't market um a pocket listing maybe it's trouble. on yeah i'm having trouble finding that one okay it's probably on my linkedin page but anyway there it is right yeah. um so so what i did is i created this post with eye candy because this house has like a 10 or 12 car garage on it. And so what I'm trying to do is market to that avatar, but I'm also trying to market to agents who might have a buyer for that type of uh, 
for that type of property, but I don't have a listing agreement and I don't have a sign in the yard. This client doesn't want a sign in the yard because they um, have a shared driveway with six other properties. They're like, I don't want people coming down my driveway. I don't want them pulling in my, in my yard. So now I'm challenged with finding um, people that would really like a property like that. So um, this is once again, you know, kind of framing the type of trying to trying to create something out of nothing. That's what you, that's what this is an example of. Yeah, you, you have a handshake right to sell. It sounds like like the, you're trying uh, to find yeah. a buyer. I'm trying. I'm trying to find a buyer, but I, I I can't put his physical address out there. And because of our MLS rules, um, I I don't want to play by the coming soon rules. So you know we we have a handshake agreement for me to to bring a buyer, but um, when it gets close, when right now we've got 12 inches of snow on the ground, yeah. he will sign a listing agreement, and they we will be doing traditional marketing by the time we get to April, but. Right now, I'm just trying to build a list of people that we can market this property to. So maybe I can sell it before we actually ever put a, put a sign in the yard. Yeah. So uh, Brittany's asking, so you primarily use Facebook biz pages and LinkedIn to generate leads. Um, I, I'm going to let you answer that. But I think most of what you're, you're content marketing, but you're, the whole thing is a running story. That's a big takeaway for me. <laughs> Cor correct. It's not just, hey, this, I got to turn my phone off real quick. Um, it's not just, hey, this is a house I just sold. It's usually a story about how we sold it, why we sold it, you know, because people buy into stories rather than just the coming, you know, just, just the just listed posts. Yeah. Are you doing, um, are you doing any other traditional lead generation, pay-per-click, Google, you know, Facebook? Um, I do not pay for leads from Zillow or realtor.com or any of those. I do feel like it's really important for people to maximize their Google My Business page. Um, I do have a Google My Business page and I have the same strategy where I post at least two or three times a week to Google My Business. And then if people are familiar with um, local business ads, local service um, ads, um, I'm just starting that as well on Google. So those are generating traffic that's very, very specific to my zip code. Um, you have to jump through a couple of hoops. You have to be, um, you have to have your background checked by Pinkerton and uh, you have to, <laughs> you have to um, post your liability insurance and my liability insurance just expired. So I'm having to update that. But if you like, yeah, there you go. If you search for um, agents, uh, real estate agents in Palo, Ohio, you see these those those ads that come up at the top are are paid ads, and then I think I'm because I haven't been certified yet, I'm right. probably on the map. So gotcha. So so you but you're eventually there. You'll eventually be there. You're working to optimize it so that you do show up up top. Is, is Correct. And, and I'm also working, um, I get a lot of leads from Home Light go. and Fast Experts. Mm -hmm. um, so hmm, I don't see myself up there. Oh, there well, you're at you're the top. top with the ad. Right. I'm at the top. Yeah. So um, I get a lot of leads from Home Light and Fast Experts. Um, I, I will give people advice on those two. If you want to get leads, you have to keep your production information up to date. So you, you download a CSV file and then you upload that to Homelight and you need to do that frequently and you'll get more activity by doing that. So Homelight and what was the other one? Uh, Fast Experts. I've never heard of that one. I know Homelight's running national campaigns. Um, right. You find that you get good higher end leads. Can you tell them you only want people in a certain price range or? or how to um, I, I'm in a very, because what it, what I think Homelight does is it looks at my production and it looks at where I've sold houses. So it sends me a, a client that looks like my previous production. I don't get, I don't get leads that are outside of my geographic area or my target market. Awesome. And the other one was fast what? Sorry, I forgot. Fast experts. Fast experts. So, 
That's interesting. So, you know, we don't talk a lot about these. So some of these third parties are legit and you're getting ROI from them. Um, yeah. And I don't pay them for the leads. I pay referral fees, but the, the downside to that is they're round robin leads. So when I show up at a listing appointment, I'm yeah. probably competing about against four people, which is where that pre listing appointment letter is very, very important for people to craft. So what is that? So before you go to the listing, you're sending them something? Sounds like. Yeah, I think I told you I, I create a Google template which um, talks about the things that I do in my marketing. It tells some success stories and it oh. puts in it puts in the customer testimonials. And then the other thing that I do is I um, I will I've created a customer testimonial letter which has four testimonials testimonials right on the letter, and at the very bottom of that is a QR code. So what I do is it, it shows the client right when I'm working with them, I hand them the letter, I take out my phone, I scan the code. So they physically have my customer testimonial letter in their hand and I show them how they can read 85 more testimonials if they want to. So I'm, I'm demonstrating it right there and getting that social proof of 85 customer testimonials right there at their table. Right, this was the proprietary letter that you were talking about. Better. Correct. Yeah. So, but you're you're doing you're doing more than the competition intentionally. You're you're instead of uh, it seems like you're zoning in on one particular opportunity and you're really focusing on it for a day or two or three, um, and, and um, really doing as much as you can to get it. Correct. Yeah. Um, mm, what else do I want to say? Well, so. so um, so you have this pipeline. Uh, it seems like it's self-fulfilling. You know, after a while, you've probably become known as a, as the luxury guy in your market. So it must get easier, right? There's this kind of curve where it's hard in the beginning, and then it, it, yeah. it does definitely get easier. One of the other things I'll say for agents is do not ignore um, online reviews. And and I know that it takes a while to build that up, but I get so many leads now from people that they'll they'll search um, Zillow in my market. And within my market, I'm like the number one or number two reviewed agent. And the, the my zip code is 43065. Um, within my market, I'm typically the number one or number two agent with reviews. And people like a woman called me last week, she's relocating um, from out of state. And she said, Hey, my wife and I are looking for a house, our budget is between 900 and a million dollars. And we looked at your online reviews and that's the kind of property that you sell. We don't want to hire an agent that sells a bunch of $200,000 properties to represent us. So I got that from the, uh, if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you see the agent finder. Sure. Yeah. I like that. I spend very little time on Zillow. <laughs> right. There you are. And, and by the way, I don't spend money on Zillow, but this is free by yeah. getting the online reviews. It's free. So you have these 85 reviews here. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and I use that in my marketing material. For instance, I do uh, I do circle prospecting and mailing around um, around properties. I've used Thanks.io to do that, and I have um, EDDM that I use for doing that. Um, and I'll, I'll frequently put a QR code to my customer testimonials. Was this on, the, uh, a QR, yeah. So anytime that they're they're handling print media, they're bouncing into the, the testimonials. Right. So you you found the video. You can yeah. see why that the pattern interrupt really works well. And it's funny, Kevin and Emily. I shared this with them, and they they got a, a laugh out of it too. They, but they told me they don't have a dog, so there's a dog in my crayon drawing. <laughs> <laughs> did you do the drawing, or did you ask like your a grandkid or somebody to do? Well, um, I actually scraped it off of Google. I just looked for, for, for Google drawing. So there you go. I, so, prob I, prob I probably should be more careful on some of my, uh, uh, what are they, the rights to use some of these things. Yeah, but it hasn't been an issue so far. That What's what's interesting to me about this is that, uh, you know, you would think that it would be more crowded at the top for these million dollar listings and stuff. But you, you talked about people leveling up. I bet a lot of people have assumed they can't compete up there. So when you busted in, how how many other agents were operating at the level you're operating at now? How many did you have to get through to become the guy? Um, I'd say um, in our in our market we have nine thousand agents, yeah. and um, in the million dollar 
agents that do more than a million, you know, million dollar listings, there's maybe a hundred agents that that are known for for handling that type of properties and then probably even a smaller group that does more than four or five maybe 25 agents that do more than four or five million dollar listings a year right so then our you most our most expensive listing in the market and, and i know this is distributed all over the country was i think 3.5 million dollars last year okay so it's not huge but it no. looks like you went you assessed the market you probably looked at what they were doing and you found some you found some ways to differentiate and went to specific channels where they weren't. Is right. that fair? Yeah. Cor correct. And strategically, what that really comes down to is we only have so many hours in the day for any one of us. And I wanted to work with clients that my average unit production, not, not only were they selling something, they were buying something. So if my average transaction is six, my average transaction is about 650,000, but that means I'm frequently selling, um, a $1.4 million listing, and that client is downsizing to a patio home, and that patio home might be 650. Or I have, you know, a client, I, I, I always want to work with people that are buying and selling. It just make you just make so much more money by by doing that. Yeah. Are, are these clients, I'm just curious, are they harder or easier to deal with? Or is it just a mix like at any other price range? Well, I think that you have to have a concierge mentality. You have to think of yourself like the hotel industry. These are not people that go and stay at the Red Roof Inn. These are people that are used to staying where a valet parks their car, takes their bags, and you have to change your mentality about servicing these clients. And if you realize that they just want a higher level of service, that's what's most important to them. But to be frank with you, I don't dress up in a suit and go call on these people. I'm frequently very, very casual when I meet with these people. And, and I do have the advantage of looking the part. I mean, yeah. an, you know, at 55 years old, a lot of my clients are baby boomers and you, you don't get a lot of 35 year old clients that are selling $1.5 million houses. So, so I identify with them as well. Right. So you end up getting the, yeah, it, it, that, that's part of it. Uh, and then you, and you also, you've kind of gravitated toward the type of business that fits your personality too, right? You, you, you probably like hanging out in, in, in nice houses and things like that. I don't know. Right. And um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, there was a property um, on a street, a private gated community, and it had been on the market for about six months and it didn't sell. And it was owned by uh, a orthopedic surgeon for the Blue Jackets, the N NHL hockey team. And um, I went in and repositioned the property with staging and video and aerial and everything that we needed. And after being on the market for hundred and probably 160 days with someone else, I sold the property within a few weeks for pretty much the asking price. So that became a client and a testimonial and a referral partner for life. So um, because he was with the Blue Jackets, when the president of the Blue Jackets wanted to sell his house, they, they hired another brokerage who was their authorized broker and that, that property, it didn't sell. So yeah. the, the orthopedic surgeon and the president of the Blue Jackets, who's now is the president of the New York Rangers, he, he made the introduction. The, the guy called me and said, hey, my, my, my buddy told me that I needed to talk to you. And so when you sit down at the table, you pretty much have to lose the listing. You don't have to win it. You have to lose it because you've already got it when you show up. And that was my first $2 million listing. Awesome. But, but all along the way you're, you're doing, we have some questions, but you're doing really good work and then, and then talking about it, but you're, you're not, it's not very like puffing up yourself, right? You're, you're, <laughs> No, it's always telling about what are the tools that are making us successful? What are we willing to invest in? What, what are we willing to do for our client? And then when I'm with the client, it, it's like, I, I assume the expense of things that other agents might not do because I want to make the, the transaction go smoothly. Um, I'll give you an example. One, one of my houses needed a brand new sump pump. I just went and had it put in and it was like $180 and some other agents maybe like, you know, 
watching their pennies. And I'm yeah. like, I, I called the I called the homeowner. The homeowner didn't live in the house anymore. And I'm like, hey, I noticed that your sump pump was an operating property. I was concerned about the safety of your house. So I had my uh, my plumber install a brand new sump pump. And he goes, what did that cost? I said, 180 bucks. He goes, he goes, let me send you. A, I'm like, no, it's it's my it's my my treat. You don't owe me anything. So when you do those type of things, the theory of reciprocity ships you know, kicks in and yeah. people want to give back to you because you've given to them. Yeah. Uh, Brittany's asking, uh, you, you know, your approach to storytelling on social media is really awesome. Do you recommend any books or resources? And, um, you know, Cialdini is a good one. That's theory of reciprocity. I'll just throw that one in there. Mention another one of his books, the psychology of influence. And the one that we mentioned earlier about pre persuasion. but what, what marketing stuff do you dig into Andrew that, that maybe would help people uh, get going on this path? I, I think, um, I was a member of the Glazer Kennedy uh, marketing group, which is a very direct response. So you have to think about, you don't just want to have an ad, you want to have an ad that has a, a call to action. And um, trying to think the ultimate marketing plan was one of their books, the uh, outrageous advertising for outrageous success. Um, it, it's a whole mindset of, uh, of creating copy that that asks for the sale and creates a story. That's a great book right there, Marketing to the yeah. Affluent. Yeah, so all of Dan Kennedy's books is about that direct response. I assumed you've probably seen this one, so. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so, um, yeah, this and, one goes deep on the on the, the, the boomer generation kind of, right? Doesn't it, it kind of? Correct. Yeah. And the other, the other thing I want to talk about, when you're marketing a luxury property, it's not, what, what you're marketing is exclusivity people want their house to be in a gated community. They want it to be exclusive because that's something that not everybody can have. So it's not about the money. It's about, you know, making them feel important, making them feel like they have um, access to something that not everybody has. Now, do you, you don't have to share too much, but do you live in these neighborhoods or in the beginning, did you, like, how do you, what, what do you say to somebody who's not, you know, maybe lives in a two hundred thousand dollars house and they're trying to go get a two million dollar listing? For, so. First of all, I, I've lived in my house for twenty one years. Um, yeah. When when I bought my home, I was an executive at a Fortune five hundred company, and I managed a five hundred million dollar division. So I, I live in an executive neighborhood, but it's not, it's it's no, nowhere near this price range. I, I'm probably more in, I'm more in the six hundred thousand dollar range, and and I say that because I've got a nice house and people. No, I live in a nice neighborhood, but I I don't go over the top like that. Right. Um, um, the other thing that I know this may sound strange, but um, early on I used to drive a really like an S class Mercedes, but I completely got away from that, and now I drive something that's more modest because I feel like sometimes when you pull up to people, they they feel like it's not a sign of your success. It's it's a sign of your you know huh. taking it. Yeah, exactly. So so now I, now I think I drive a a Toyota Highlander. So, you know, just a nice, clean car that everybody can respect. It's a, it's a utilitarian, uh, get the job done kind of car. And exactly. I mean, obviously, I, I still sell two and $300,000 houses, and I just wouldn't feel comfortable pulling up in an S-Class Mercedes because you alienate yourself from the client. Right. Something right in the middle. Um, you right. need to be able to serve everybody, but you definitely... You definitely went at this with strategically with a niche in mind when you started. You weren't you weren't you were maximizing your uh, transaction side, your commission, uh, right? From right. the beginning. And yeah. remember, we talked about that exclusive mindset. Um, yeah. I, I just want to share something that it's almost like those television shows. I had a property that I was selling for one point two million, and the the client had was a was a sign call. He saw my sign on the back of the golf course. So he called me and we made an appointment to see the house. And, and I got an, into his mind and I figured out what it, he was all about. And he was a car collector. So what I did for that particular individual is I went out and I bought a replica of the Corvette that he personally owned, like, like one of those that's about, you know, that can sit on your tabletop. Yeah. And he, he enjoyed racing, car racing. So I went to the, to the club and I, I talked to the, to the, to the guy that manages the clubhouse. And I'm like, hey, I want to put this in Mr. Locker. And it had a, it was the car. And then it was a map that told how to get from the club to the property that I had listed. So you can see it was like 
personalizing it for him and telling them, hey, within four miles, you can be from the club to your garage. Well, he, he wasn't, he, they had just aerated the greens. So what we did, what I did is I drove all the way across town 30 minutes to this guy's house, knocked on the door at seven o'clock at night. And I said, hey, Bob, um, I just, I, I dropped, I was leaving this present for you at the club and the guy told me you wouldn't be in so I just wanted so we ended up chatting about cars we never talked about real estate we talked about cars we talked about his car collection we made it all about him and that's what people have to realize people want to talk about themselves so if you're good at asking questions the more questions you ask about them the more they like you and that that client I've now done 1.1 1.2 and I have a 1.3 million dollar listing with that client right now so See, all from all from driving over and giving them a 29 dollar <laughs> gift and talking about cars so you're yeah you're serving and making friends and it sounds like it's kind of fun <laughs> it is fun it is fun <laughs> yeah. uh, so um uh, Brittany's asking has there ever been a time when you turned down a listing um yeah um i i an, and usually you end up regretting it. And usually it's over a disagreement on the price. And I think we're all struggling with when you go into a listing and the, the owner has a significant valuation in their mind. And I just had one of these happen to me. Um, I thought the house was probably worth about seven and a quarter. And the guy was adamant that the house was worth 850. And I'm like, you know, I really like you and I don't want to disappoint you. And if I list your house for 850, I just think it's going to be painful for both you and me. So I suggest that if you if you have to be at 850, you hire someone else. And if that works out, I'm happy for it. And if it doesn't, um, I mean, no. I'm here when here when you're ready. But but the thing that burns my ass is that the house was listed at 850, eight and a quarter, 799, yeah. 750. Yeah. So if, if I would have just taken the listing at 850, you would have got the, the house is. I would have got the reductions anyway. So, you know, shame on me. I should have done it. Yeah. But yeah, you live and learn, but yeah, that's, that's just, um, there's, there's a certain level of integrity there though, that you showed. And even if what's interesting is you may find yourself getting a referral from that guy in the future, if the current agent blew, blows the relationship at all, because right. you were, you were right about the price at the end of the day. Right. It, Unfortunately that seemed to happen on, you know, <laughs> We are in a crazy market where people are overbidding, but not so not so much in the luxury market. Yeah, very cool. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, uh, let's just get quickly into technology. You know, I know you you use uh, K plus for a long time. Uh, your yep. current brokerage provides another solution. We won't name it. Uh, Correct. Correct. <laughs> we still love you. <laughs> so you're well, you're transitioning. Well, Ryan, Ryan. Brian, let me say, I actually am running them in tandem. Oh, okay, you are. Okay. I actually currently have, it's it's difficult for me to write the check, but um, I still like a lot of things that, that uh, KV Core does. And I'm in the K the Conversion Plus version. So some of these people are in a little bit different version. Yeah, so how do you use, just real quick, how do you use those tools? Because you have, you have this whole plan operating here that's storytelling and social media. How do you integrate technology into that? You know, um, I, I, on, on KV Plus, I try to take them into a, um, a, a landing page where it collects information and then, then it puts them on a search or it puts them on a, a market update because I, I don't use the, the, the scripts uh, so much that, you know, I, I know that you have the ability to write a script, but I don't always know what the avatar is that people that that hit that page. So they're just pretty much doing property updates to them. And then when I visually see that they're opening more or engaging more, then I then I like to go out and uh, text them. I frankly don't like to call people. I know that if my phone rings and I don't recognize the number, I just let it go to voicemail. So yeah. I find that texting um, is much more engaging. So you, you intentionally though, as you meet new people, you're putting them into your database and you're kind of letting property alerts do, do, do a lot of the heavy lifting. Correct. And, and every open house that I meet people, um, I put them in there. But I, I'll, I'll caution agents who use a very, very blanket approach. When you first reach out that first time to someone that you met at an open house, you want to filter that email very, very specifically and ask in the form of a question, in my opinion, and say, hey, Jim, based off of what we talked about, I picked out 
three properties that I want you to look at. I'd love for you to give me your feedback on that. So it doesn't feel like you're just dumping, you yeah. know, 15, 16, 17 properties. It feels this, like you're giving them. This is what I, I personally did. I taught my buyer's agents to do and it changes everything. It is a lot of work though. I mean, if you've got, if you've got five, right. you have 10 people at an open house today, or you have a buyer, you know, you have five buyer leads coming in a day, but it really is worth the time to take 20 minutes and think about that person and find three properties for them. Hey, hey and switch, I'm going back to LinkedIn. If yeah. I meet someone at an open house, by the time they leave the driveway, I've went, I've gone, I've used my iPad. I go onto LinkedIn. I find if they're on LinkedIn, yeah. I reach out to them and say, Hey, Jim, thanks for showing up at my property, blah, you know, today. I really like chatting with you and your wife, blah, 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 blah. So, so I, I try to reach out to them immediately on social media, LinkedIn and probably Facebook. Yeah. What's really cool. Interesting about LinkedIn is you probably get a lot of people who just don't look at their LinkedIn and never hear back. Right. Correct. Um, but the Correct. ones who use it, use it. Right. <laughs> and and right. You're, you're probably the only agent in their stream because most agents are over on Facebook. They're not over here. Um, right. I, I missed your report last week on LinkedIn pay-per-click, but yeah. um, I'm for, for my brokerage, I'm running some recruiting in the Columbus market. So I'm actually created a, a, um, an audience of people that are realtors, J just like you probably taught this in the thing. Yeah. And um, now I'm running at, you, you won't see it on this page because it's, it's a marketing page, but now I'm getting engagement through the LinkedIn and through the LinkedIn marketplace for realtors um, because we're trying to build out our influence in central Ohio. Mm -hmm. So I'm actually using the pay-per-click version of LinkedIn to reach those people as well. Yeah, it's really smart. I let that, believe me, a lot of people listening to this are very concerned about recruiting. So this right. this definitely makes sense. And you can target much more efficiently here than you can on Facebook, I think. Um, or oh, yeah. a better way to say that is you probably have less people targeting agents on LinkedIn than you do on Facebook. Um, it, you know, it's, it, there's opportunity there. Right. I just, I think that you have to be very careful with the message because so much, so many of us don't want to be like, you know, automatic the first thing that comes out of their mouth is like um if i could show you this would you be interested because it just it just feels like you're getting pulled into that pitch yeah um do you use instagram at all for agent lead gen or for for luxury stuff i think you probably need to go down to someone maybe five years younger than me yeah <laughs> it's, well, it's not instagram is not i mean i have an instagram page and I post via Facebook to Instagram, but it's not where I spend, it's not my expertise. And the key takeaway here is it's, it's probably makes sense for all of us. Just pick one that fits you and, and, right. and really dominate. You've obviously looked at LinkedIn and said, I'm going to dominate LinkedIn. And then maybe I'll use Facebook a little here and there. Um, it's, it's funny when, when I, we get together as realtors, because I really, I try to build out my relationship with realtors on LinkedIn too, because when I post a property, I want them to see my properties on LinkedIn because they may have a buyer for it. But when I when I go to these social gatherings like we used to have, people would be like, "Oh, you're the LinkedIn guy." So you know, I have that reputation for doing for being there all the time. Yeah, good good question from Kirk. Are you paying for like LinkedIn Navigator or whatever their premium stuff is? Or I think it's thirty nine dollars a month, and it's it's definitely if if you're going to utilize LinkedIn for lead generation like I do, it's 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 valuable. Um, I'll just share another success story so I can monetize this. Yeah. Um, I um, There was a, someone moving here from Dallas, Texas, and I was posting information on LinkedIn all the time. Well, the person moving here from Dallas, Texas, his financial planner was living in Columbus, Ohio. The financial planner, who I never met, um, said to this relocation client, well, if you're looking for a house in Columbus, Ohio, this guy, Andrew Robinson, is the guy that you need to talk to. So that all those posts on LinkedIn were third party referrals to someone who I never met because of that content. And that ended up being a $500,000 uh, purchase. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. That's awesome. So, so the paid version, uh, I think, based on what I know of Navigator, I've used it a little bit, and you know, allows you to surgically go in and just pick off people one at a time and connect with them. And what, Correct. what is your, how do you, with somebody who's cold, how do you, what's your, what's your lead in? What, what do you say? Um, typically I just look at their profile the first time mm -hmm. and then I comment on one of their posts, just like you would, you know, start to engage them. And then you ask them a question that's not, that, that's like, 
not really. Hey, I, 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 I saw that, you know, house that you just listed or whatever. Congratulations. You just have to open up a dialogue like you would, like you were in a bar. You know, you wouldn't go into a bar and say, hey, it's good to meet you. Let's leave. Let's go home. It's like, you're not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So that would be on the agent recruiting. You talk about something they posted or real estate related. If it's just a say it's the surgeon or the or the, you know, somebody who you suspect might own a luxury home in your area. Do you send them something real estate related or do you just say, hey, nice post about X, Y, Z? You just like their post. Um, maybe you comment a little bit on it or yeah. share it. I mean. People just want to feel like you're paying attention to what, know. They're, what they're saying. Go ahead. Yeah, we all want to be, I know that if I post, you know, I post a lot, but if if somebody com actually takes the time to comment right. and I don't know who they are, it's, you can't resist. You click through to the profile. Right. You have to, <laughs> you just have right. to. Right, so, right. So they click through to your profile, like, oh, this guy's a luxury agent. Um, and maybe they follow you back, but they're putting it in the back of their head, even if it's not very consciously, like this guy's it's like your first touch and it, you're introducing the real estate without talking about real estate. That's what I'm saying. And, and then if somebody, if you, if you use the navigator to see who's visited your page, okay. then you go, then you go back and you're like, Hey Ryan, I noticed you were visiting my page. You know, how are things in Florida? Yeah. It's just, just a conversation starter. Great. Andrew, thanks, man. This is, we're coming up on the hour, but I think I, we I've hardly we've had really had any guests. I don't think we've had anybody on in a long time on these sessions. And you, I'm just really excited that you're willing to come on. And the feedback we're getting in the comments is awesome. Um, Great. Well, it, I go ahead. I was going to say, if people want to reach out to you, obviously there's the LinkedIn. I'll post I'll post this. Um, uh, if they have any follow up questions for you, anything else you want to add? No, I th I think you know by by reaching out, there, there's so many places that are inexpensive. And obviously this is an inexpensive way, but it's a discipline where you just have to put something out multiple times a week, just like Facebook or Instagram or any other do you, things. Do you time block for this or do you just kind of, it's a habit now and you just do it? Yeah. Um, I try to do it in the morning because we, we know that people go to their offices, they look at their LinkedIn pages at, you know, at eight or nine in the morning. It's not really productive if you put these things on there at eight o'clock at night. Got it. Yeah, question about the replay. Yeah, it'll be in the mastermind in, in a few hours. Um, Andrew, I'd love to see you back here again. And people uh, definitely go connect with Andrew, watch what he's doing and, and copy it. Even if it's, you're not in the luxury market, if it's not your cup of tea, I think this translates to, to any number of niches. Um, yeah. You know, LinkedIn to me looks like if I, I'm not very comfortable in your, in your niche, but I can see this being right. a great fertile ground for an investment niche if you work with right. investors uh, right. or help people buy their first investment property. Cool. Um, yeah, so I think that's about it. I don't see any other questions. Do we miss any anything? People who are watching, just chat your questions in. Um, otherwise, people are just saying, thanks, Andrew. I don't know if you can see the comments, but we've gotten nice feedback and appreciate everybody's uh, questions here. Great. Cool. All right. So we'll see you next Tuesday, everybody. I'll get this replay up as soon as possible. Annalisa, have a good day. Um, and uh, Andrew, have a good day. You thanks. too. Thanks, fellas. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Yes, bye.